Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus. I'm Trace. This is a podcast style show where we take one topic and we break it into a bunch of chunks so everybody, myself included, can understand it a bit better. And this week we're talking about survival. What is survival, right? We're talking about how it's changed from when we lived in trees to now we're living in human built cities and how that's changed how we survive. So we gotta start. What is survival? Survival, in, when you think about it, you probably think of survival of the fittest, right? In the late 1800s, British naturalist Charles Darwin looked at this idea of the survival of the fittest. He created this, this plan of evolution, what that could mean. According to his theory, humans were not put on earth and created by a divine entity. Rather, they've been here for a long time, evolving and changing and learning and adapting. And they would share this common heritage with all these other species. Genetics, of course, has helped validate that theory even further. And all living things are designed or controlled by this combination of different genes. If you haven't checked out our genes episode, make sure you do that. Any design flaws that end up in our genes, they don't survive. Over time, they end up getting bred out of the species. That is the survival of the fittest. And it's based on two different basic tracks. Environmental selection, which is a species with those design flaws in their genetics don't end up surviving the elements. And then there's sexual selection, which is species or members of a species with any design flaws appear weak and undesirable, so others will not reproduce with them. The best genes get passed on because the best genes are gonna survive those two selection processes and then get handed down the line. Eventually, we have a whole genetic makeup that's been molded by this plan. And that comes down to survival, right? So how did humans survive then? What did we do that was so special? Why are we here now? Most of our research on early human life suggests that the first two-legged hominids came about about four million years ago after a prolonged cooling period on our planet. And they survived by learning to adapt and change, which meant a lot of dead humans, or ancient humans in this case. There was a number of different biogenetic flourishing over the years that became extinct. And now we're left with Homo sapiens as the sole survivor of this massive chain of survival tactics. Some worked, some didn't. But how did we retain these survival instincts, right? How did we gain survival out of this? Well, based on a study published in 2007 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, modern humans are experts in spotting predators and prey. We have really good vision for that. And we can run really well, that also helps. And we can use this still today. So ancient humans were living in a world that was much more dangerous, but the things that were attacking them were predators, right? They were defending themselves from predators, other living things, usually, that would be trying to attack them. And just like our hunter-gatherers of old, modern humans are still experts at spotting predators and prey, even though a lot of us now live in pretty comfortable and safe places, relatively speaking, houses and suburbs and things. Humans today, though, are hardwired to pay attention to other people and animals more so than non-living things. But inanimate objects are still pretty likely to kill us. They are our predators. So at our core, even the most dedicated office worker has survival instincts, the same as our hunting and gathering ancestors ingrained into their brains. For example, you're much more likely to be killed or injured by a car today than you are by, say, like a jaguar on the street. But you're probably going to spot the jaguar before you see that car that's about to run you down. Which, ironically, could also be a jaguar, but that's a whole other thing. So, what kind of characteristics have modern humans evolved for survival? Over all of this time, one of those might be selfishness. Survival seems kind of selfish. In a book released in 2010 called The Last Train from Hiroshima, author Charles Pellegrino quotes a Hiroshima survivor as saying that the ones who survived were those who looked after their own safety. They were being selfish. Self-centered, guided by instinct, and not civilization, is his quote. So is survival innately selfish? What do you think? Or is it just smart? 
Is going into a dangerous scenario to save others always going to be a courageous act? It's kind of against our own survival. Of course, it can also just be stupid to do that. It's not just courageous to run into a burning building. It can also be stupid. One of the most, if not the most important factor for survival is whether a person can keep their wits about them during a crisis or whether they fall apart and can't continue on. I don't know how many crises you, our audience, have been in, but when a crisis hits, what you do in that moment isn't something that you can necessarily plan out. How you react can, in some ways, be instinctual. And this begs the question of responsibility of those who can keep the wits about them. If I keep my wits about it myself during a crisis, does that mean I have more responsibility to act and help others survive? Or should I be selfish and run away and protect myself? Do I have a duty to self-preserve then? It's a good question. There's not really a solid answer. But let me give you a really cool example that we found while we were researching this episode. In a famous mountain climbing accident written about in a book turned documentary called Touching the Void, climber Simon Yates had the unfortunate task of trying to help his fellow climber who was injured on the mountain. Okay, so we've got healthy climber, we've got injured climber. Survival says selfishness should set in, right? But of course, that's not, it, their climbers know each other. They're going to have to figure it out. As the healthy climber tried to rope him down the mountain, bad weather hit. So he's trying to help this injured guy down the mountain. Weather shows up, makes it very difficult, and Yates was struck with this dilemma. He could be selfish and cut the injured climber free and save himself, or he could try to save them both. Sounds like a jerk move, but he ended up cutting the cord. I'm just going to lay that out there. I'm not going to keep you in suspense. The thing is, in doing so, he survived. But when he cut the cord, the other injured climber also did survive somehow. Today, spoiler alert, they're still friends. The other climber realized the survival was imminent on him being cut free. It doesn't mean that Survival is selfish, I don't think, but it could mean that there's a selfish component to it. But, you know, they're still friends. Because we all are living on the same planet. We're all trying to survive regardless. Speaking of friends, we want to thank our friends and sponsors, the United States Air Force, for this episode. Every day, American airmen constantly go above and beyond to break barriers, both professionally and personally. And they do this to help others and not for personal survival or selfish reasons. Come back tomorrow to find out all about how humans survived from living in trees and caves all the way up to today with modern houses and urban environments. Make sure you subscribe for more Test Tube Plus. And if you just can't wait to see that tomorrow, check out last week's episodes. We talked all about the internet. It's pretty awesome. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow.